I am technologically challenged, as you probably have already figured out based on what's going on up here in front for those of you that can see me. And I'm used to having Peggy Miller run all the equipment for me. But today I'll try to do some of it myself. So if your screen goes black or if something happens on the other end at the other three locations, it's probably my fault. <laughs> Uh, Don and I did drive up here this morning, and we are actually as close to this location in Minnesota as we are to Iowa State. Uh, we're closer to three other uh, state capitals than we are Des Moines, Iowa. So we live in the very northwest corner of the state, a long ways from anywhere and any place. Um, I thank you for that introduction, but the way I probably learn most about people is I ask them, how they start out their day and what they do. And um, like most of you, I started out this morning with my chores. I got up this morning and I put on my socks and I still got one black toenail from last year's foal crop, but it's about grown out. <laughs> I've got a couple of marks on my shins because we were working with baby foals yesterday. Uh, I go out and meet my dogs every morning like all of you do. Everybody has to have a dog if you have a horse. I think it's a requirement. Um, from the dogs, I go to the stallion barn and she said, I, I have four stands that we stand, uh, we breed our own mares, we also collect semen and we ship it across the country. From there I go to an outside pen after I fed the stands and I've got some mares outside and they're the ones that we take on wagon trains across South Dakota and go trail riding on. Uh, and until earlier this week I had my Western Pleasure mare that I show located outside in that pen and we, we sold that to a, a young lady in our neighborhood. Uh, the big barn at our place, we start out and we go in and we have uh, three or four horses in the first stalls that we're getting ready to show this upcoming year. Uh, the next stalls consist of six of our mares who have already foaled out this year. Uh, very happy to have four, four healthy foals, four fillies and, and two stud colts. Uh, the next step in our barn is, is our breeding laboratory and I normally stop in there and grab a Diet Coke, but we have an extensive laboratory. Uh, we collect stallions, uh, we process semen there, we do all uh, artificial insemination, we don't do any live covering. Uh, from that laboratory, and that laboratory has everything from uh, incubators, centrifuges, uh, semen counters, we have ultrasounds, uh, the whole works. The next part of our barn has mares that aren't currently in fall, but we're working on breeding. Um, they've all been under lights for a while, and, and some of those are maiden mares, and some of those are mares that we left open because we thought they'd fall too late. Uh, the next part of our barn, and back in the arena, we have another half dozen stalls, and we have some horses there that Excuse we're getting me. ready. Um, are you aware that you're feeding your cock into the arena? I, I was, I'm not aware of that, no. I've just been asked if I'm aware that my talk is being broadcast into the arena. And uh, apparently they're not appreciating it, so we'll let, we'll let somebody, somebody can work on that, but I'm not going to, I won't touch anything. <laughs> anyway, those, keep on going back on I'm doing fine, okay. Anyway, <laughs> that, that back barn has horses, we're getting ready for sale and, and potential uh, uh, show horses, but uh, we'll see if I can make something work here a minute now. The reason we're here today, of course, is to talk about uh, insurance, but now you know a little bit about what I, what I really do, and I'm a hands-on guy and uh, probably spend as much or more time with my horses every day than, than uh, most of you even do. We're going to talk about coverages for your horse. We're going to talk a little bit about coverages for various equine activities, talk a little bit more about some liability coverages. Oh, there we go. It's working good. The first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of mortality coverage. And basic mortality policies that we sell are, are no more than a life insurance policy. Now, the only thing different about our, our policies is we do include theft coverage. So you get the life insurance benefit plus the theft coverage. Uh, and we also allow for humane destruction. So if there's a case where a horse really needs to be put down, we'll, we'll go ahead and go along with that. Unfortunately, we have to do that too frequently, uh, but we do allow for humane destruction. These are basically all risk policies. Uh, we have horses that get, get hurt and injured and eventually pass away for lots and lots and lots of reasons. Uh, our premiums 
are going to be based on what breed it is. And we'll show you some rates here in just a little bit so you get an idea of what things cost. Um, but it could be a quarter horse, or it can be a thoroughbred, or it can be a paint horse, or a POA. So the breeds affect it. The, the bloodlines sometimes affect our rating halter horses, which I do a lot with, have a higher rate uh, than most other activities. Uh, the age of the horse, of course, is important to, to know because that affects premiums as well as the use of that horse. So we'll flip to our, our next page here. And I think you might have a copy of this in your, in your book. Uh, hopefully yours is large enough to read. But you can see there that we start out by insuring foals. And once a, once a baby's on the ground and has nursed, uh, starting at 24 hours of age, we can insure those babies. And you can see the, the rate there for the first 30 days is 7%. So that $10,000 baby is going to cost $700 a year to insure. We also have the ability to and have on occasion insured the unborn foals and those mamas and uh, that's quite quite a bit more expensive than this but if people have a really good mare and they've got a high price uh, stud service into that mare they are willing to insure that baby before it's born and, and we can do that also. You'll see once we reach 31 days that rate uh, drops substantially down to five and a half percent and then from 91 days to the end of the first year, the end of December, that rate drops down to 5.5 percent. So as the horse gets a little bit older, the premiums come down a little bit. Once we start talking about horses that are a year old and through age 14, you can see we have various rates based on the activity they're involved in. Uh, the cutting rate Cutting and reining rate is 3.2 percent. You can see our Western pleasure rate, or just pleasure horse rate, or hunter under saddle rates is going to be 3.6 percent. Uh, the, the roping rodeo barrel race type horse has another rate of 3.8, and then there's our halter horses, and as you can see, the rate for the halter horses is 5.5 percent. Uh, a lot higher on halter horses, and all those rates are based on mortality rates. They're actuarially figured and the reason those rates are what they are is based on the amount of losses we have. Right below uh, the halter class we also have a class for a breeding horse and that can be your brood mares, that can be your breeding stallion and the rate on those is 3.2 percent. Below that we have listed stallion accident, sickness and disease fertility coverage and that's coverage you can add to your stallion and should your stallion be unable to settle a mare uh, for an additional half percent in premium, we'll pay you the value of that horse. That stallion has to have had one full crop alive and on the ground uh, before we can provide that coverage. Did we get our broadcasting fixed? Okay. There wasn't anybody in the arena applauding that I heard, was there? I didn't hear that. Were they, were they booing? No. They weren't booing either. They are just like, what's he doing? Okay. As you can see at the very bottom of that page, we talk a little bit about uh, premiums for older horses. And I realize an 11-year-old horse isn't an old horse in most people's eyes. But at age 11, or 15-year-old horse, excuse me, at age 15, the rates start to go up a little bit. And you can see every year they continue to increase. Until age 20, it's 18.5% annual. And then from that point on, uh, we'd have to get a special quote if you had a horse we needed to insure beyond age 20. There are some uh, discounts available uh, if you have a stable full of horses you want us to insure. But to get those, we need to be talking some fairly large numbers, a uh, quarter of a million dollars coverage or more typically. We're going to talk now just a little bit about major medical coverage. The major medical policies that we offer on your horses are probably pretty similar to one you might have for yourself or your family. Um, you buy an amount of coverage, you pick your deductible, they can cover accidents, injury, or illness, have an annual premium, and we pay your claims if you have problems. A lot of the pictures on these slides are, are pictures of me and my horses. This, this is not me, by the way, on this particular one. I don't know who that person is, but uh, I've had that happen to me numerous times. So, 
We'll talk a little bit about uh, major medical, but we'll also talk about some surgical coverages that are available. And uh, you can buy surgical coverage on your horse without buying the entire major medical package. Surgical coverages cover the things we show there on our slide. They'll cover the anesthesia. They'll cover surgeries that are caused by accident, injury, or illness. Uh, in addition to the surgery, they'll pay some additional fees for hospitalization, x-rays, lab tests, etc. Typically, aftercare or board uh, will not be covered under these policies. An example is I had a horse, we were in uh, someplace in Nebraska, Lincoln, I think we had a, a horse colic, and we took it to Omaha, and we had colic surgery done on that horse. Well, I decided to leave it there for a couple of weeks before I hauled it back to Northwest Iowa, so I had to pay the aftercare and the board while they took care of that horse for me and did, did the bandaging and, and things that needed and needed to be done. Now, I don't know if you can read that or not. Is that big enough you can see that? I don't know. I understand you all have a book there that has my slides in it. Can you read it on my slides or not? No? You can tell us about it. Okay, I guess I'm going to read to you. Okay, so because my screen is, is also a little bit hard to read, I'm going to have to rely on my notes. So if you see me looking down here, this is my crib sheet. But basically what that slide shows you is some different coverages. We offer colic coverage. It just covers colic. We offer a surgical coverage, which will cover, cover other surgeries. Then we also offer two major medical plans, one with a $10,000 limit and one with a $15,000 limit. The premiums are shown there. If you buy colic surgery alone, the annual premium is $150 per year per horse. You got a $10,000 limit with a $250 deductible. If you buy surgical coverage, that will cover, cover other surgeries that need to be done, and whether that's a chip in a hock or a cyst in a stifle or whatever that may be, it will cover surgical things. That will cost you another $200 or $150, and it's got a $250 deductible. What we recommend to most of our clients is that you buy one of the major medical coverages. Major medical coverage costs $375 a year, but it picks up all those surgery coverages. It also picks up all the other sicknesses and illnesses and injuries that you may need covered. So you could be at a horse show and there might be something running through the barn and you may be required to have somebody come take care of your horse, not do a surgery, not do anything like that, but you might have to run fluids. You might have to put your horse on meds. A lot of times when we're at a a horse show and we're a long ways from home and spend a couple weeks in a barn, you can get a really, form a really, really close relationship with a veterinarian because they're there every day and just trying to ward off things that are going on. But this will cover all those illnesses and things you hear about. You said the major medicals uh, have a $10,000 limit for three seventy five dollars a year, or you can go to the $15,000. Uh, coverage package and the premium is $475 a year. Now, some of the things that you probably aren't aware that would be covered but are, I'm going to read these to you because uh, we do not cover pre existing conditions. We do not cover acupuncture, which I use a lot on my horses. I'm a believer in it, but it's not covered by these type policies. And we don't cover joint injections, which I frequently done to my Western Pleasure horse. But we do cover things like uh, respiratory surgeries. We can do respiratory breathing treatments on a horse, and we'll cover those things. We'll cover stem cell therapy, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen that happen or seen what's involved in that. I was at the Congress a couple of years ago, and one of my veterinarian friends uh, invited me to his stalls, and they had a mare that they cut a slit just to the right side of her tail, and they carved out, filleted out just a little bit of fat that she carried back there, put it into a small vial about the size of a prescription bottle you might get from your drugstore, overnighted that out to Davis, University of California, they had it back to us the next day, and instead of a vial full of horse fat, we had about two cc's of a serum. And most of these vets now have 
good enough equipment that you can look at a horse's leg and you can see the torn tendon and then they inject that obviously not where it's torn because there's nothing there but they inject either above or below that tendon and you can actually see that serum injected into that horse and what that stem cell process will do it will help heal that horse hopefully faster than it normally would heal but more importantly more thoroughly and do a better job of healing that horse so you may hear of somebody having that done and it really isn't that complicated of a process and it isn't horribly expensive but we do cover stem cell treatments uh, we cover shockwave therapy and maybe some of you have seen that you've been in the barn when they've been treating a horse for that but we will cover that there is a limit on that of uh, twelve hundred dollars occurrence and then we also cover IRAP treatments and for those of you that don't know what that is is sometimes we'll draw blood from a horse take it back to the lab they, sp they spin it and I'm not a veterinarian so I don't know exactly how to explain this but it gathers up the platelets and then they re-inject that blood back into the horse and it promotes faster healing we cover those things um, there's lots of things that we cover uh, we also have lots and lots of claims because of all these things we cover one of the things that I'll tell you about. I'm going to tell you about a couple of the worst claims I've had. And these have all been mortality claims, but we'll talk a little bit about a claim. Uh, a friend of our family who showed horses at quarter horse shows and open shows went to an open show one weekend and uh, their daughter tied their horse to the trailer, was brushing out its tail, stepped on the Rubbermaid stool, got into the trailer to put on her show outfit, felt this trailer move came out and her horse was electrocuted. It touched its nose on that aluminum trailer and killed it instantly. It turned out she had a fray in her drop cord. And they drug the drop cord under the trailer. Somehow they scraped something loose. The horse had on steel shoes standing in grass from the dew of the morning at that open show. But their family didn't get hurt. But, but we lost a horse. Now that was a very tragic loss just because I guess I knew all the people and knew the little girl that owned the horse. Uh, we've had a, a breeding stallion who for some reason started losing its eyesight and because it was in a mare, in a mare barn and of course the mares were there and we were approaching breeding season, he became rambunctious and started injuring himself and couldn't see what was going on and started battering his head against the walls and things. That particular horse we put down for humane reasons. Uh, that horse wasn't able to exist without its eyesight. It was a nine-year-old stallion. So sometimes we allow people to put down horses. Uh, I have a thoroughbred breeder that we insure horses for, and he had a young stallion. And you're all aware that thoroughbreds in the polo club, they all do live cover. Uh, a lot of the other breeds, myself, my quarter horses, we do all artificial insemination. But this young stallion on the first mare was going to breed. She kicked him and broke between his shoulder and his knee, broke that bone seven places. You know, so we have, we have horrible, tragic claims when we have claims, other than just the colic claims you hear about. Uh, one last bad claim we have uh, always involves those that are in, in vehicle accidents. We have more of those every year than, than you might realize. Some of the horses come out of those well, some don't. Uh, so there's lots of ways we have claims. Let's move on to something uh, a little more cheerful. We'll talk about that stallion infertility coverage. As I said, we can add that to your stallion's mortality policy for one half a percent additional premium. And it provides coverage in the event the stallion is permanently incapable of settling mares as a result of an accident, sickness, or disease. My friend Jim Brinkman and I bought a stallion a couple of years ago called Two Reds. They uh, paid $42,500 for him. They told us they collected semen. It was good semen. We believed every word they said, but they were subject to us collecting and checking semen again. Uh, we could no longer get good semen out of that horse. Uh, sold him as a gelding four days later. Um, 
somewhere along the line he'd been sick and something happened to him that lost his fertility. Those things happen, they especially happen to horses that are on the road a lot. You go into a barn and you don't know who's been there the day before, the week before, the month before. So things happen. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive coverage if you have a stallion and I think every one of our clients that stands the stallion buys that coverage. Time for a drink. <laughs> Normally when I get to speak to a group right after lunch, everybody is asleep and you're doing surprisingly well. Uh, I haven't heard anybody snore yet and there aren't any heads down on the desk, so thank you for your attentiveness. Let's talk a little bit about loss of use coverage. We don't sell this very often. It's extremely expensive, but there are special needs for this coverage. And this will cover horses that are totally or permanently incapable of fulfilling a specific function which they are needed for. So an example would be a barrel racing gelding. Okay, if it was a mare, she couldn't race barrels, she could still race holes. If it was a stallion, he maybe couldn't jump the fence anymore, but he could still collect semen. So there's, there's some of those horses that when they go out and pay sizable amounts of money for them, they want to insure them for loss of use. Again, we don't do that very frequently. Um, we'll pay a percentage of the value for economic destruction or if they prefer they can turn the horse over to us and give us its papers and we'll take possession of the horse. The last horse I wrote that on was a barrel racing horse and that was a, a gelding that uh, brought a little bit over $100,000. So he had value as a barrel racing gelding but other than that he's probably going to be a, a pasture ornament. Uh, he's still running and doing well. so. We haven't had to pay a claim for him. I think that's all I want to talk about as far as coverages for your horses. Wade, would you mind asking, we have some specific questions, and if you would just repeat the question. Um, if you trade for a horse, can you get your horse insured without proof of purchase amount? The question is, if you trade horses, can you get your horse insured without proof of the value of that horse at time of purchase. Yes, you can. Um, there's a number of ways we determine value when we insure a horse. Um, if you buy a horse from an individual and you write a check, obviously that's that value on that given day. If you get involved in some trading, we may need an appraisal or an opinion to verify what that horse is worth. And at the time of loss, we'll need to back that up. So typically, when we ensure that horse has been involved in a trade, we specifically list that on the application. That yes, you bought the $20,000 mare, but you traded in your $7,500 gelding, and you gave $12,000, and then we establish our value. And if the companies accept that and establish that, that's fine. On a, a young horse you buy that maybe you're going to put into trade, now you're yawning. I saw that. <laughs> Don't let her go down, all right? Keep her away. Anyway. That's the, I think that's the next oh. question, is what if you have a horse that has increased in value since you bought them, like a young horse or a horse in training? Is receipt of training enough to show an increase in value? Okay, the next question that I was about to answer before it was asked was, how do we take care of increased value on those horses that we buy, we break, and we have in training? We'll go back a little bit further than that and we'll go back to how do we establish cover on that baby when it's born, on that foal. We'll insure those foals for three times the stud service fee the day they're born, okay? So we can insure them for three times the stud service fee. If somebody comes up and actually tries to buy that horse from you and says, I'll give you $15,000 for that horse and you don't sell it, you come to me and you say, Don Ellibrook offered me $15,000 for that horse but I chose not to sell. I want to insure it for that. We can do that. Okay, that young horse we're putting in the training. We buy a two-year-old. We decide we're going to take it to a trainer. That trainer charges a set fee every month and not setting anybody's fees but using a round number that I can deal with up here. Let's say the fee is $1,000 a month. Well, probably $500 of that cost is for boarding the horse, feeding it, taking care of his bedding, and the other $500 is 
is for the training. So yeah, if you have your horse in training for six months, you can take the $500, the actual training fee, times the six months and add another $3,000 to that value. And then once you get it to the show pen, if that's what your intent is, you start establishing a show record, you then have the ability to increase that value based on your show record. So there's lots of ways we can increase value, but we just have some way to establish and base that value to the insurance company. Do you cover massage therapy under the preventative care? Um, we typically do not. The question. Oh, the question was, do we cover massage therapy? And the answer to that is probably not. However, sometimes that's incorporated into some other therapies that are done, so sometimes we do. So how's that for a non-answer to a question? <laughs> One last question before I let you move on. Um, if bloodlines are unknown, does that affect the premium? No, we have. If the, the question is, if the bloodlines are unknown, does that affect the premiums? And by that, I don't know if you mean it's a grade horse. Maybe, I don't know. It has no registration. Uh, we have an area where we have grade horses covered. The sheet I showed you, I think, showed quarter horses, uh, paints, pinnos, Appaloosas. But yeah, we have a special sheet for thoroughbreds, and we have a, a rate sheet for grade horses. And, and we insure grade horses for people all the time. Uh, so, you know, maybe the best, the best trail riding horse in the world, maybe that grade horse that you own, but you can't enter him in a quarter horse show. But that certainly doesn't mean that horse doesn't have substantial value. And a lot of these guys that do fox hunting and stuff like that, boy, there are all sorts of mixed bloodlines sometimes there. So uh, we can insure any horse with any type of breeding. Is that our last question on? For now. For, for now. Okay. <laughs> One more time for a drink here, and then we're going to talk on about ensuring equine activities. Everybody in the room here in St. Paul just took a drink at the same time I did. I want to thank you for all going along with that. Okay, here we go. Equine activities. Equine liability coverages. And I understand that you had an attorney here that maybe talked to you about that at quite some length, so I'm not an attorney, I'm an insurance agent. But what we do is we provide coverages that protect you if you are sued by a third party for damages, property damages or bodily injury coverage while you're involved in any owned equine exposure. Coverages are also provided for defense. We'll hire an attorney and defend you and for claims that you are legally liable up to our policy limits. Our policy limits typically start out at $300,000. We'll go up to a million dollars. A little later on in our discussion, we'll talk about umbrella policies that we can put on top of that and add another $5 million. So we can get you to a $6 million limit. We'll talk first about personal horse owner's liability. And again, this provides coverage for bodily injury and property damage to a third party caused by the insured and personally owned horse when used for non-commercial purposes. And there's all sorts of things that can happen. Um, I don't even want to begin telling you the things that happen where horses get people in trouble. And for horses, or people get horses in trouble would maybe be a better description. But things happen, accidents happen, horses get loose. Um, there's all sorts of things that happen. An acquaintance of mine decided she was going to help a friend minister some drugs to one of her friend's barrel racing horses because it was a little bit sore on his front legs. So they thought some banamine might be the answer to that question. And when she went to inject that in the vein, she went a little bit too deep and got into an artery. And the horse ended up living through this experience, but by the time it flipped over three times, had done about $40,000 damages to the vehicles in the parking lot where they decided to administer this drug. It lit on top of the hood of the minivan, it took out the windshield, flopped over on top of the Buick, and then reared back and hit the pickup. Um, things happen. 
somebody's always at fault when things happen anymore. It doesn't seem anything's an accident. But there's there's just tons of things that that can happen. You can take a horse to a parade. You can just do all sorts of stuff and, and have some liability exposure. Fortunately, if you're a one or a two horse owner and you talk to your insurance agent, you can get that coverage added right to your farm owner's policy or homeowner's policy and you do not have to get involved in a more complicated and commercial type policy. Equine commercial general liability is for commercial equestrian activities such as boarding horses, instructing, training, breeding, horse sales, everything from carriage rides to handicap riding facilities. Uh, there's all sorts of different exposures that we cover in our office. Coverages can be extended for off-premises, for your activities away from your home, and for those who may be riding instructors, uh, you need that coverage and it follows you wherever you're at. So you can be taking a client to a horse show, or you can go to somebody else's facility and give a lesson uh, to their private arena or their house, wherever. Uh, so you can have coverage wherever you're at, whether it's at the home, horse show, or away from home. Coverage for claims and defense fees resulting from any negligent errors or omissions arising from professional equine activities are covered. We talk about trainers that rent out facilities is one of those things we just mentioned. Probably the attorney that talked to you, and I, I apologize, I don't know who that was, but anyway, probably mentioned to you there are equine laws in all of our states, and the four states that are involved in our conference here today all have state laws say if you become involved in an equine activity you're assuming some risk of your own and the person also there doesn't have any liability so if we all went to the horse show together we're riding around in the arena and my mare kicks yours because your mare maybe got a little close to mine you won't be able to sue me you entered into an equine activity and we take some risk and we do that okay and I, they probably talked about that didn't they in great length more than you want to know? <laughs> oh, no. No. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say any more about that. Then. But there, there is an equine liability law in each of the four states. It does not mean you cannot be sued. All it says is you're not supposed to be liable. But if they sue you, we will defend you. And hopefully we will win, but sometimes we lose. So it's still important to have that coverage, even though that law is out there. Or you'll spend many, many dollars defending yourself to win your case. Next coverage, this is working really good today, by the way, your computer. Uh, the next coverage we want to talk about, I, I, I sure is going like, don't, don't say anymore. You'd be surprised how I can screw up computers, given chance. The next coverage I want to talk about is for that person that has that boarding stable, or a trainer who has a horse in their care, custody, control, where they bring a mare to your place to be bred, um, you have some legal obligations to the people that entrusted that horse with you. Um, people that board horses have obligations to keep fences up, have obligations to keep stalls in good conditions, have obligations to keep the feed room locked or at least closed so if a horse gets out it can't get in there. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Uh, you might accidentally start your barn on fire and then you're responsible for all those horses that are stabled with you. These policies are typically sold with varying limits. You can put a limit, maximum limit per horse, and the maximum number of horses you have per stable. An example would be, I want to insure all these horses $10,000 a piece, and I'm only going to have 10 of them in my place, so I want $100,000 worth of coverage. So if they all perish in a fire or something, You've got coverage for that horse you are responsible for. Sometimes it's just an injury, sometimes they die. Sometimes it's just a lot of expensive medical care. Sometimes they may want you to replace a horse. Again, uh, we'll defend you and protect you and pay if you're liable. 
We also provide coverage for equine activities, including horse shows and events. So every time somebody organizes a horse show, they create a liability exposure for themselves or their saddle club, or even a trail ride, any sort of equine event that you're involved in, you have an exposure. And so we ensure from clinics to horse shows the trail rides, to anything you about think of. Uh, you buy the coverage based on the days you're going to have it, the number of people that are going to be there, they're all a little bit different. Typically the policies we sell for people running horse shows include a move-in day, the horse shows, and then a, another day to move activities out. Uh, Ray, there's a question. Um, what does liability coverage cost? The question was, what does liability coverage cost? And again, I'll give you one of these vague answers. It depends. <laughs> All these policies are, are rated separately and differently depending upon your oper operation. Um, we'll use a typical horse show, one day, $150 a judge. Okay? Typically, we have minimum premiums, minimum numbers of days we cover them. For a, a riding stable or boarding stable, it, it changes all sorts of ways. At my house, we have four breeding stallions, but I don't let anybody bring a mare in. I only ship semen out. That's a lot different than the person that brings mares and babies into their facility because they've hugely increased their exposure because now they got to take care of the mare and they got to take care of the baby and then they got to try to get her in a foal too. We're a little lazy at our house. We just collect the semen and we send it to them and then put it on the back of the recipient at the other end to have a good veterinarian. But every one is different and, and we certainly can, can provide anyone a, a quote if you're interested. You just need to contact our office. We send out a rather lengthy brochure or application, but most of the stuff doesn't apply to you, so you just cross out the parts that, that don't apply. Um, so I guess I can't give you a for sure answer. Any other questions? On that. Okay, we'll move on. Talk about riding clubs and associations. Uh, we talk about the liability coverage and those are the things you have from your public events. We talk about your horse shows, your trail rides, and all sorts of things. Uh, we're not going to be liable to your club members, but we are to the general public, the people that come you know, to watch. Um, here's an example of a seven uh, day public event during the year we charge if we write let's say we write a saddle club we typically buy seven days of coverage a horse show might only buy three but that saddle club might have three days of shows three days of trail ride and the big annual banquet so there's there's lots of things we can cover other than a horse show we also can provide coverage for their directors and officers and we more frequently than we care to pay claims to those people involved in those organizations who wear the hat as a director or a president or a club secretary. You have to be very, very careful in those positions because the things you represent to the public had darn well better not only be correct, but ought to be stated in a manner that's acceptable to everybody. Examples of some claims we've had. Newsletters. Most organizations, we say, let somebody else own your newsletter, write it for you. You don't want to be responsible for exposure you have there. So if they list Wade and Judy Ellibrook, Judy Ellibrook was my first wife. My second wife, Donna, who's sitting here in the room, might be very upset if that was published in the local magazine, right? So you have exposure for things like that. She's looking, she's mad at me now. <laughs> uh, we've had officers in saddle clubs who have put things out for bid and maybe have someone provide a newsletter or some, something for you, a meal or something. And one of the directors has said in an open meeting, that person really took advantage of us, misrepresented what they were selling us, and as far as I am, we don't have to pay them, goddammit. 
And the last one of those that we got involved with, they not only paid that person, we gave him another $25,000 and we paid the attorneys $10,000 to get us out of that. So there's lots of liability exposures that we cover. One of the things I mentioned earlier was umbrella liability coverages and most of the groups, organizations, and individuals we do business with, in addition to buying the basic policies, their basic liability coverages, they go ahead and they buy the umbrella policies uh, because there seems to be no limit on what you can be sued for and there apparently there aren't too many people that care about how much you lose or have to pay. And if you have any assets, uh, you sure don't want to lose those. So I don't know how long I've talked or how long I have left. Good. That, now what did that mean? Huh? 15 minutes. Have 15 minutes left, she said. Okay. So when she says good, you never know. Um, so if, if any of you have any questions out there, yes. Um, as The question is, if as a saddle club officer, your organization has something happen where you're sued and your club does not have enough coverage, can they go after you personally? And in most cases, the answer is yes. So many of the people that serve in those positions require their club to buy coverages with large limits. And it, and it can be anything from a horse getting out of the arena at the horse show. A barrel racing horse comes out, bumps the gate, it pops open, shoots out on the road, while wow, things are out of control for a little bit. A car comes, it runs over a, you know, a spectator. Uh, you know, those of us that go to horse shows just know all sorts of things that can happen. An example of another claim we had, one of our organizations, had a horse show they sponsored and at that show they allowed vendors to come in and place their booths for exhibitors to look at and the one booth had a whole bunch of really nice fancy mirrors and the horse came around the corner and wow there ended up being mirrors and horses all over the place uh, you know probably wasn't the best place to put that booth Nobody intentionally did anything wrong, but because of circumstances, there was some exposure there and we ended up paying for some injuries to a horse. And the person with the booth wasn't upset. We didn't have to pay for the damaged materials, but we did have a horse that got hurt. Uh, it could have been worse. It could have been a horse that got hurt that hurt a person. You know, I, and if that's something that the association or club is responsible for, yes, you have liability exposure. We have an online question um, from Nebraska. With loss of use coverage, will the insurance company only pay out if the horse is too nearly euthanized or turned over to the insurance company? For instance, if you have a Grand Prix horse which can no longer jump but could live out its life comfortably um, but only as a pasture ornament and it cannot be used as its original purpose. The question was regarding a, a loss of use claim on a jumping horse. He became injured to the point that uh, he could no longer be much more than a pasture ornament. Do you have to put the horse down? Do you have to turn over the papers to the insurance company? Sometimes, once in a while, on occasion, you can negotiate those things typically and receive partial payments and, and keep that horse. So if you want to keep that horse and just trail ride on it a little bit, you can negotiate a value of what that horse would be worth as a trail ride horse since it's no longer a jumping horse. So most of these claims are individual in nature and they all have 
lot of different answers. Not everything is set in stone. Does a homeowner policy cover liability on the horse farm? The question uh, now is, is, will your homeowner's policy cover liability on a horse farm? Typically, your homeowner's policy, you should check with your agent, double sure this, and you know, most, most of these agents are really good insurance agents, but they know very little about what we do with horses. That's why I told you what I did at the beginning of every day. Most of your agents don't have a clue what you're talking about. But you need to get something from them to say they're going to provide you coverage and you want it in writing, but typically that will quit at about two horses. So if you have a, a 4-H exhibitor who has a horse, you probably don't have a problem. Now the question was, on a horse farm, which then talks in bigger scale, and in my particular case, I call mine a horse farm. We have 30-some head of horses there all the time. No, no, my homeowners, my farm owners will not cover that. And so in addition to that policy I buy that covers my buildings and my barns, I also buy an individual equine liability policy because I have stallions, I go to horse shows, I sell horses out of my barn, I have a riding arena, so no, it typically will not. And when you ask your agent, if he says, yeah, don't worry, don't worry about it, say good, Jim, just write me a letter so I can put it in my file, and then I'm sure I won't worry about it. Because he probably has errors and omissions insurance also, and if he made a mistake, and he'll end up handling your loss for you. All right, um, a question from Minnesota. I'd like to hear more online. Go ahead, Kim. So, I bought my two horses, and I did ask my homeowner's insurance person if they would cover any liability, and I got the deer in the headlights book. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, of course, I've never gotten liability insurance. Can I purchase that from you guys separate? Because these guys, they really don't have to. Well, you're going to think I planted this question up here in Minnesota, but this gal just asked me if, uh, when she talks to her agent about whether or not she has and she board. equine insurance, she boards her horses, and she gets a deer in the headlights look from him. And that's what I just said earlier. He doesn't understand what we do. Um, we do at my office. And her next question was, can she buy coverage from me? that exposure and yes you most certainly can <laughs> and there's we actually do business in in 32 states and three foreign countries uh, we write a lot of equine insurance all my contact information is in the book and you just need to contact us at our office and we'll be more than happy to provide you with a proposal so thank you for that question so a uh, question from Nebraska for a stable of about 10 schooling horses that uh, what would be the cost range for a commercial general liability insurance with a minimum one million dollars per occurrence providing coverage for bodily injury and property damage you give it generally <laughs> that, that was we just had a really long question and i'm going to make a really short question a person has a horse barn with 10 horses in training Schooling, even for lessons. schooling, lessons, excuse me, for lessons. How much would the premium be to have bodily injury and property damage coverage and a million dollar umbrella? You honestly need to call me at my office. I'll send you an application to fill out and we'll provide you absolutely free a quote, a proposal. But there's lots of questions that go into all of these because everybody's stable is different. Some of us have pipe fence, some of us have wood fence, some of us have wire fence. Some of us have indoor riding arenas, some of us have outdoor riding arenas. Uh, some of us require students to wear helmets. Uh, there's just, they're just all sorts of questions that we need to know to determine what the rate would be for your facility. We have lots and lots of information we can give you about things you need to do at your facility to reduce your premiums. Um, recently I did a, uh, some work over at uh, Ellsworth College in their equine department. And we went through their equine facility and 
just things like proper signage and proper latches on gates and all sorts of things like that. Uh, special feed rooms, just rubber mats and wash racks, things like that. All of those things will affect the premium that we'll end up charging, as well as the age. Oops, we lost our computer. We're good. She yeah. says we're good. Oh, thank you. I thought I broke it. I normally do. <laughs> but anyway, there's so there's so many variables for me to just blurt out two thousand two hundred twenty-two dollars, which is probably close. <laughs> it isn't the right answer. So we really need to have more contact with you, and we'll provide you proposals at no cost, no obligation, and then it's up to you to decide what parts of those coverage you want, because you may want some care, custody, and control coverages if you have somebody else's horse. Or there's just you may want to insure all your horses. There's just lots of variables. Um, another question from Michigan: um, If I am providing a service on a horse farm, in this case, farrier work on the customer's property, and I and I get hurt. Should I have my own coverage? This is a question, I believe, from a farrier who wants to know if he goes to a horse barn and is providing work. He's an independent contractor. He's wanting to know if he needs to have his own insurance uh, for his personal injury. And if he is an independent contractor, yes, he has that responsibility. If he's a full-time employee of that stable, the stable owner should provide that coverage. I carry work comp in my barn because I have people that come and help me on a daily basis. But an independent contractor, typically the definition of an independent contractor is a person that shows up in their own vehicle pretty much when they want, they bring all their own equipment, they charge you what they think is fair and you'll pay, and they pack up and leave. Okay, so he's an independent contractor. If I said, come to my barn, I have all the tools, the shoes, I'm going to have you shoe a couple of horses. I want you there at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Then they're my employee, and I provide them with all those things. Then I would have to provide that coverage. If they're an independent contractor, have their own tools, their own equipment, make their own schedule, set their own fees, then they have to have their own coverage. Any questions from Minnesota? The last one. I'm filling out on the commercial liability. And it's one of the questions that how many questions are you getting released? You know, it's a lot of questions like that where, okay, this is a huge, but, you know, maybe they come up with a lot of 20, you know, I, I just wonder how to, you know, what a range Okay, we have a question here in Minnesota. A gal's filling out a equine liability application, and the question on that application has to do with how many lessons she's doing each week or month or year and you you don't know it'll vary it'll change um, it may be good it may not be so good it may get really slow so you need to put down a good estimate and if you have a year's experience before that that's a good place to start so if in 2011 you gave 153 lessons say in 2011 I gave 153 lessons we anticipate about the same amount for 2012 you won't get in any trouble for doing that. But if in 2011 you did 153 lessons and you put on that application, you think you're going to do 10? That's fraud. That's misrepresentation. So, you know, base it on base it on something, or at least put an estimate. Say, based on what's going on right now, which is February, I'm going to give about 25 lessons a week times 50 weeks is that. Because then they can come back and you can verify you start out telling the truth and you made an estimate from that point. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what kind of liability, liability insurance should a horse show judge have? Liability insurance for a horse show judge. Yes, we sell that. Um, you can get in trouble as a horse show judge for a number of reasons. Uh, most of the time it's not for how you place the horse. <laughs> Most of the time it's how you responded to an exhibitor or how you responded to someone who was there to watch the show. You proclaim yourself to be professional horsemen. You need to behave in professional manners and all professional activities. So there's lots of things you can do to get in trouble. 
I was in the show ring one time with a good friend of mine. The guy in front of us asked the judge if he was absolutely blind and did he want to borrow his glasses. And while I thought it was extremely humorous, <laughs> the, the judge in question, who I know quite well too, did not. <laughs> but he was very calm and he went over, and he got the ring steward and he says, this guy is out of this show for inappropriate behavior. I want you to dismiss him from the arena. Do not want to see him again today. So that judge did that correctly. I have another acquaintance who is a judge who doesn't do things quite so correctly. And he has a rather hot temper and he has a wide range of vocabulary. And he, he can get in a lot of trouble real quick. All right, um, what are your, it's from Iowa, what are your recommendations for loose dogs that I assume don't belong to the property on the property around horse boarding facilities? Questions regarding loose dogs at horse boarding facilities. Typically, when you fill out those equine applications, those liability applications, they ask you how many dogs you have and what kind they are and do they run free. Okay? And I said earlier, I think it's prerequisite of owning a horse to have at least one dog. We have four at our place, but we have kennels we can put them in and we can control them. Um, if you're a commercial activity, you probably better have a really good dog and maybe only one or two of them. And once you have a problem, then you need to take care of that problem and either high fence that dog. But typically you're okay if you got a dog or two running around in the barn, as long as they aren't. And I don't like to blame pit bulls, but everybody picks on pit bulls and they aren't necessarily all mean, but they carry that stigmatism and Doberman pinchers and German shepherds. But you have some liability exposures and you need to be careful and uh, be careful. Is a health exam required to verify health before coverage is provided? Health examinations is a question on a mortality policy. In our office, anything $50,000 or less, we do not require a health certificate to provide coverage and buying coverage. If you have a horse that's valued higher than that, yes, we do. And if you're purchasing it, I am sure you're probably getting a pre-purchase exam. And that certainly is adequate for us uh, to indicate that horse is healthy. Any questions here in Minnesota? One last one from the home. Oh, go ahead. If a horse has an existing policy and it is sold, is that possible? The question is, if a horse has an existing policy and the horse is sold, can that policy go with the horse? And yeah, we can add another insured onto that policy and let it extend for the length of that policy. Uh, typically, you sell them for more than you got them insured for. Don't we? We hope to, don't we? She says no. <laughs> but, but then, you know, if you sell it for less than you got insured for, no, we got to change the limit. Hopefully you'll sell it for more than you've got insured for, so you want them to buy a new policy at the higher limit. And I also have sold horses for less than I have insured them for and less than I have invested in them. One last question that I think is unique from Nebraska. How does insurance respond to helmet waivers? How does insurance respond to helmet waivers? I don't think we allow for helmet waivers. I think if you're a trainer, and depending on what you're doing, to you have coverage with us in some places, cover, helmets are required, especially with young people in introductory lessons and training situations, 4-H age, age people. If you have a, an adult a client who's coming for their riding lessons, we're okay with them not wearing a helmet. So if I come to your facility and you're, you've kept my Western Pleasure Mare and I get there to ride that night, I don't have to wear a helmet and there's no problem. But with young riders, uh, we need to know what you're doing and you may have to have them available. Uh, so we need to see your application, it tells exactly what you're doing, and then we'll respond. All right, well that's the time we have here. We just want to thank everyone and um, let's thank great. I did it. Well, thank you very much for having me. So everybody have a good, safe trip on the way home.
All right, let's just take a quick five minute break and then we'll get back together for our round table and kind of have a close up discussion and then we can hit the road. Well, I'll plug you.